of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you never cease to relate to us in various amazing and creative ways. Through the wonders of technology, though not face to face, you allow our ideas to be shared with ease despite physical distance. You bring us closer to each other in an instance and even to strangers. You help us build new friendships as your virtual messengers. Send your Holy Spirit to inspire us as we begin this online gathering. Bless everyone who toil to make this project possible, the speakers, the facilitators, the technical crew, as well as the participants and viewers. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. facilitator for this session. We are webcasting live from this university in Butuan City, Philippines. We are also joined by Mr. Mark Bon Basadre of the Social Sciences Division as our technical assistant for this session. We would like to acknowledge our participants through Zoom and FB Live. Welcome to this session. For the webinar guidelines, the speaker is given 45 minutes, 45 minutes to talk about this topic. The talk will be followed by a 15 minutes open forum, and you may write your concise question on the chat box or on the comment section. You are allowed to ask one follow-up question. To avoid untoward incidents, the microphone of the participants will be muted throughout the session. Everyone is expected to observe proper decorum. In the spirit of accountability, please ch change your Zoom name using the, the format flashed on your screen. Only participants with the prescribed name and format will be allowed in the meeting room. And lastly, be circumspect and respectful in sharing opinions and in the, co in the comment section, be reminded that this is an academic assembly. Before we formally start our program, here are the winners of the Orion Voters Education Games for yesterday's session. Your names will be flashed on the screen. Congratulations to our winners and please wait for a representative uh, from the Social Sciences Division to message you and FSU you learn on how are you going to claim your prizes. As we draw closer to the national and local election on May 9, we are holding this voters' education to help you choose wisely your candidate, candidates who will be our leaders in the next six years. Let us look at this video to provide us with a better context about the situation.
The Philippine national elections is less than a month away. Who will you vote for? Have you decided? Why will you vote for these people? And why not? Through the Orient Poll survey, majority of the respondents from the tertiary level show that fake news and historical revisionism influence their choices. FSUU values how important and critical this democratic exercise is and mobilizes to educate and remind the Orient community on how important it is to critically discern in choosing the country's future leaders grounded on the university core values. Voting is a right, a privilege, but most of all, a responsibility. FSUU aims to breed responsible, rational, and radical voters through this webinar series. Remember, information shapes decisions. Let us contribute to a community of well-informed people. Political stability seeps into all aspects of life specifically playing a vital role towards the economic condition of the country. This goes on to say that the political leaders that we choose are in the crucial position of driving our economy either towards economic growth or stagnation. So, what's in it for us? As voters, we need to be more critical and discerning in choosing the next leaders. A leader that can address the present economic condition and can create sustainable economic growth for the future. In the second session of the Orion Voters Education webinar series, let us take a deeper look into the current state of our country's economy so that hopefully we will have a better idea on what kind of leader we should look for. Our informed choices will lead us to the leader that will improve the lives of the present and future generations. The Philippine national elections is less than a month away. Our speaker this afternoon is the Dean of John Gokongwei School of Management of Ateneo de Manila University. He is the former chair of the Department of Economics of School of Social Sciences, also of Ateneo de Manila. Before joining Ateneo, he worked as actuarial programmer in the Insurance Services Office Incorporated in the Old World Trade Center in New York City, USA. He holds a PhD in economics in Fordham University, the Jesuit University of New York City. His research interest is in macroeconomics, financial economics, and international finance. Dear friends, my professor in advanced macroeconomics, Dr. Luis S. Dumlao. Let's give him a virtual applause. Good afternoon, sir, Dumlao. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, let me share my, uh, uh, my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, actually, the, uh, I just forwarded to your professor, uh, uh, Joseph Cashion, the uh, uh, a, a slight different version of what I'm going to talk about today. The, the, the talk about today is about, uh, I was invited here to talk about, and as mentioned by Professor Cassion, is the uh, is the Korean Voters Education, Father Sakutnino, uh, Korean University, the current state of the Philippine economy and the leaders uh, we need. By, by talking about the current state of the Philippine economy, I, I had my I had my usual presentation, and then because of the the the, uh, the reference of what we're going to be talking about, which is towards the election and the leaders we needed, it's really a combination of two. Uh, however, when I practiced, uh, when I recorded myself in the second part, uh, the one that has to do more with the uh, the election as opposed to the just the current state of the economy, I ended up with having uh, well sixty five slides. Uh, that is to say, uh, about 40, just about the current state of the economy, and about 24 in relation to the uh, uh, to the economy from a historical perspective, and from a perspective where you can decide 
where where to vote. So in the interest of time limit, so I'll just go skip with the uh, uh, with the uh, not the current state of the economy per se, but the the state of the economy historically speaking. So we would have some sort of a perspective on uh, uh, historically who to vote, where well, how what what is our struggle historically in terms of our economy. <laughs> So, so that the, the title of my presentation is the the Pitik sa utak test, uh, which is has two parts, which is Pitik and and the utak, uh, Pitik test and the the utak test. Uh, literally, the 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 niche test and the the, the utak test. Uh, so, if I may, I, so uh, of course, in the Q and A, if you have questions regarding in more current uh, economic state, then I can e I can easily refer to the the, the uh, to the uh, earlier slides that I won't be presenting. Uh, so, in in this Orion voters education, uh, we are in the twenty days before national election, and uh, in this twenty days before national election. Uh, I, I was told of this, uh, I, I adopted this, this, this Pitik test, and this time it is a historical perspective, not just, uh, it is a historical perspective, but not uh, something that is uh, really present. But from a historical perspective, this is the Pitik test. It's, I, I got this from my colleague in the, in the Ateneo de Manila. Uh, his name is, uh, probably you heard of him, is, uh, uh, Shell Habito, who was the former director general of the of the National Economic uh, Development uh, 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 Administration, and uh, or, or NEDA. And, and the Pitik test is when he said he said this when people when he has to present to people or business people or people in general, uh, the one that focuses the most to make it easier, simply simple to present is the Pitik test, where you have the P, which is refers to the, the pressure or price, which is measured by inflation. Then you have trabajo, so so jobs, and K, which stands for, for kita. So or and kita usually measured in terms of the GDP growth. And, and so that we uh, adapt that, so it's as simple as it gets. So let's go to what I'll do first is, is look at the Pitik test from a historical perspective. Of course, in the Pitik test, the first one is price. So we will look at the, the inflation. So pressure and inflation historically. Uh, as you will see here, these have been the inflation, uh, the, the past uh, uh, from 1971 to 2022, so more than 50 years. And the present inflation is 3.4%. And uh, and we all know that people are complaining about the, the increase in the price of gasoline and the inflation right now is 3.4%. Shocks, shocks are usually externally driven and supply side. That means we have nothing to do with it because it's something that happened globally. For example, this shock here, which happened in the early 1970s, has to do with the first oil crisis. Uh, this shock here has to do with the second oil crisis. This is the uh, the the crisis in uh, Iran, and then the next one here is this one. I have it in blue to to make just a distinction that this is not, in a sense, something that is uh, historically or something that's externally driven, but rather it's self-inflicting. We had the debt crisis in 1984, 85, and eventually 86. And, and that is our fault, it, or, or the administration's fault, or, or, or our government's fault. And this is something that we could have avoided. Uh, the next one is the global recession in Kuwait, uh, the global recession in the Kuwait invasion, about 1991. And then the next one is the Asian financial crisis and the worst in Lino. So, uh, and that was in 1998. So we cannot do anything about that. That's uh, supply side. So uh, not, not any human being can do anything about that. That's externally driven and supply side. And then the next one is the, this one, this spike here is the Iraq war and the increase of the value added tax as, uh, as uh, uh, under President Arroyo. And that is, in a sense, self-inflicting. The, the fact that we raised the value at the tax, we implemented it, we made it a law, it caused a spike in inflation. 
Uh, and then you have the global financial crisis of 2008. So this is probably something you might remember. You were most of our students are already born then. And then the, the, uh, the shortage of rice uh, during the uh, early years of President, uh, two years ago under President uh, Duterte. And, and now, of course, it's 3.4%. So uh, it's usually externally driven with some exemptions. And of course, the other one here is something that we could have avoided, the African swine fever. That's just a year ago uh, or two years ago. Uh, this is something that we could have with proper management. It's something that we could have prevented. The second uh, perspective that you can see here is that um, for every administration, inflation have been milder except for the present. So, for example, during the President Marcos years, uh, uh, the average inflation in all those from 19, uh, from available, what available data says, 1971 to 1986, the average is 16.2%. So how bad is that 16.2% inflation? Remember, what do we have right now? Our present inflation is 3.4%, and people are already clamoring for the suspension of the, uh, of the excise tax on gasoline. So people are already complaining. People are saying tuition fees are increasing and everything, the food. But that's 3.4% inflation right now. But imagine 16.2%. That's how bad it was. Uh, then, sorry, uh, let me uh, backtrack. And then during the President Aquino years, it's still not good, but it's less, a bit lower, 11.9%. And then this is now the President uh, uh, Ramos years, which uh, they were inflation average 7.8%. And this is now the President uh, Arroyo years, which average, uh, where inflation averaged 4.4% and President Aquino, 2.7% average inflation. Uh, during President Duterte years, inflation for, went up for the first time in, in so many. So you all see the pattern going up and, and in President Duterte years, it went up a bit. Although this 3.4% is, is still, in a sense, we are complaining, we see it in newspapers, but this is still, uh, from a historical standpoint, it's it's quite mild. Another observation is that extremes have become less. These are the, the extremes. Uh, for example, during President Marcos years, inflation went could down could, uh, as low as 8%, and then it could spike up to 50%. So just, just imagine, right now we are complaining of this 3.4% inflation, but in 1985, inflation was 50%. That, that's how it was going, in a sense, uh, that's about uh, uh, more than 10 times what we have right now. Um, and then extremes, they were, it's, it's still extreme during the President Corazon Aquino years. Uh, the extremes were from zero to, to uh, less than 20%. And then these are President um, uh, Ramos years, where you, you see the the the, uh, the, the extremes have, have narrowed a bit. And then and here this is the President Arroyo years. The extremes continue to narrow. Not only do they narrow, but the the, the pattern has been going down. And then this is the President uh, Benigno Aquino years again. Pattern uh, slowly going down. Um, uh, the pattern is still quite, uh, the, the, the extremes are, are still uh, narrow, but uh, uh, the extremes are uh, not so bad, but uh, it, it went up a bit during President Duterte years. So, so that, that is my PITIC test. So from a, historical, from a historical perspective, you would see now uh, that it's, it's quite obvious that among these administrations, uh, uh, if we compare uh, in, in terms of prices, the Philippines was worst off during President Marcos years. And the Philippines was best off, was best during President Pinigno Aquino years. 
that's the that's the pressure. That's the P of the PITIC test. We go now to the trabajo of the PITIC test, the, the letter T of the PITIC test, which is can be measured in terms of uh, employment such un or unemployment. And, and this is the 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 black ones are the the the, the actual unemployment. And I put the I put the, the straight lines in average, uh, for example, uh, and what we see here is, uh, for example, Estrada had the worst record in terms of, President Estrada had the worst record in terms of unemployment. That's that's right there. Yeah, that's uh, just just under average, just under 11%. The, the line is so short because he was president only for, for two years. As people here might recall, he, he was eventually uh, uh, Ousted, uh, but he had the highest unemployment rate. The Marcos had the best record in terms of unemployment. Uh, this green here is President Marcos years, and this is the lowest average unemployment rate among all administrations from 1950s to 2020. The end of Marcos was the beginning of 15 years close to 10% unemployment. You see this here, this is less than 6% unemployment, average unemployment rate during the Marcos years. But after that, after that, there were 15 years. That's that's about 15 years of closely close to 10% unemployment rate under four administrations, uh, under President Aquino, President uh, Ramos, President Estrada, and President uh, Arroyo. So, so the verdict, as indicated here, if it's trabajo that we're speaking, it's uh, it's basically it's uh, uh, the worst off is president. We were worst off during President Estrada years, but we were best during President uh, Marcos years. Uh, now I go to the kita. Now the, the letter K of the. Uh, of the of the uh, of the, the of the PITIC test, and, and you, you'd see here now again this is the, the this is the actual GDP growth, uh, the actual growth of the income national income of the economy for the past uh, um, eighty years, and you'd see here that uh, Duterte had the President Duterte had the worst record in terms of growth. The, the average being uh, some, something like 3.4, 3.5%. Uh, and he had the worst contraction in, in 70 years. So during the pre President Duterte, we actually had, but in a sense, we have to understand also that this is because of the COVID. And any president who suffers such uh, a pandemic uh, is deemed to, to, to have a slower growth. Uh, Carino, President Aquino has the best record in terms of growth. This is President Aquino years. Uh, that's close to, uh, that's 8% inflation. Uh, but then again, uh, we keep in mind that uh, uh, it's easy it's easy to grow faster after World War II because you're starting from, uh, from scratch. If you're starting from one and then you grow from one to two, that's 100% increase. But if you are starting from 100, and you go from 100 to 1, that's only a 1% increase. So the worst recession lasting for two years in the past 70 years was with Marcos. These were, this were 1985 and 1986, or 1984, 1985, where you have two consecutive years of about 7% contraction. The, the, the size of the our income of the economy actually became smaller for two consecutive years. Uh, still, because Marcos performed well in the 1970s, um, President Marcos years, if you average out the, the annual growth rate, uh, it is still slightly higher than President Aquino years because President Aquino years is, is this thing in him. I should have made this yellow to make it easier to, to, uh, to relate to, but that's less than 4%. Uh, but President Marcos' years was uh, just about 4%. So Marcos, in terms of average income, performed better. So there goes your, your the Kita part. That's the, the letter K. And this that goes your PITIC test. Uh, 
So in, in summary of this critique test, we are worst off during President Marcos years and we were best during President uh, Benigno Aquino years. In terms of uh, unemployment or trabajo, uh, we were best during President Marcos years and we were worst off during President Estrada years. Uh, uh, and then in terms of Kita, it's really uh, between uh, uh, the, you would see here that President Marcos did not really perform that badly in terms of GDP. So in a sense, if you give President Marcos the, the benefit of the doubt, he, he passed two out of three, if you could say that. Then we go to the UTAC test, the historical perspective. Um, the UTAC test is something I thought about. How come so, how, why do so many economists say that our economy was worst off during the Marcos years when in a simple critic test, he did very badly, we did very badly in terms of inflation, but not really in terms of uh, unemployment and, and, and income. And so what, what if we, did, we think deeper and we have the UTAC test and the UTAC test, I think, it, well, I, what I have here is really, U is the, it's still, un, uh, uh, U now is the utang, which is our debt, and then T and K are still trabajo and kita. So what is the, the UTAC test in, in, in this thing? And, and in this, this is now our external debt. This is our debt uh, in, in, mil, in millions of pesos. And this is nominal, this is, that's our extern, uh, debt to outsiders. So, uh, so this is the usual narrative that you would hear. Um, uh, this here in this graph, we, Marcos in 1970 had uh, our government, our country had the debt of 13 billion pesos, uh, which in 1986, when he ended, when he left was 496 billion pesos. Uh, President Corazon Aquino took over and under her administration, our national debt uh, uh, doubled to 893 billion pesos. Uh, President Ramos more than doubled, and Ramos, the debt more than doubled to 2.2 trillion pesos. And then President Arroyo, uh, well, President, uh, this is, President Arroyo, it's from, so President Estrada went to 2.6 trillion pesos and uh, under President Arroyo, our debt went to 2.9 trillion pesos. So a mild increase in, uh, in, in, uh, in 10 years of, uh, of leadership. Uh, and then President Aquino, uh, the debt increased from 2.9 trillion to 3.5 trillion pesos. Uh, and now under the debt administration, the debt now is 3.5 trillion to 4.3 trillion pesos. And, and that is what where many people from, uh, uh, from the Marcos side are, are speaking of that indeed they were best, you know, the, when they left the debt was only less than uh, half a, a trillion pesos. Now it's 4.3 trillion pesos. Uh, but then we keep in mind that that is the nominal debt. Uh, what if we express it in terms of the real debt? Um, the difference between the nominal is, the thing is, um, I might owe you 100 pesos right now. Uh, but then again, uh, that's equivalent to two kilos. Uh, but then again, uh, 30 years ago, I might owe you 50 pesos only. But what if the price of, ri of, of, of rice was 10 pesos per kilo? So my 100 pesos debt right now is equivalent to two kilos of rice, whereas my 50 pesos of debt 30 years ago was equivalent to five kilos of rice. So, so you cannot really compare it. So what we do is we set them in the same setting, same price. What if the price were set as if we were in 2018? Uh, in that case, the equivalent debt when Marcos started in 1918 prices was it started out with 1 trillion pesos and increased to 3.7 trillion pesos. Uh, President Aquino, uh, 
the debt uh, she paid out from 3.7 trillion pesos to 3 trillion pesos. The debt actually declined under President Aquino in real terms during her time. Uh, but then again, it went, it spiked again to 5.1 trillion pesos during the Ramos years. And this has to do with the uh, Asian financial crisis. It was, uh, it was, yes, the debt increased, but it was a necessary thing to do to save the economy. We had to borrow to save the economy. And so did Thailand, Malaysia, and, and, and many of, and, and most of the economies around the, uh, in, in Asia. During the Estrada Arroyo, uh, the, the 5.1 trillion years went now to 3.7 trillion pesos in 2018 prices, uh, equivalent prices. To it. And then in, in President Benigno Aquino, uh, it went slightly up to 3.7 trillion pesos. So if you, ter if you think nominal, then we can easily be fooled that uh, President Ram Marcos did the best. But, uh, but here it's really a mixed thing, although uh, it, it's really mixed. Uh, we don't, there's, there's no verdict who really did the, the best in that sense. Uh, so I will not go through the, uh, this is the, the UTAC test. And again, the, this is the UTANG, the letter U of the UTAC test. And then the letter T is trabajo. We saw that already in the critique test. And we saw that in terms of trabajo, we were best during President Marcos years. And in terms of Kita, it's, it's really mixed, but, but, we're, but definitely uh, President Marcos did not flunk the test. Um, but we go a bit deeper again. We had the PITIC test and we had the UTAP test. What if we combine the two? And we, we you know, PITIC the test, we shake our head a bit, we think deeper. What if we combine the two and use the what I call the petik sa utak test. And in the petik sa utak test, basically what I have here is what I have here on the, on the vertical axis here. This is the petik test. This is your presyo, trabaho, kita. And what I have up here is the utang, trabaho, kita. And what we have been doing all along is we have been presenting these variables separately. But what if we are to present them together? Maybe we would have a clearer picture. Because after all, one cannot be separated from the other. Uh, in the case of this quadrant here, utang and presyo, if we combine the two, uh, what if you say, mura nga ang bilihin, ang dami mo naman utang, or, uh, Wala ka namang utang, wala, wala kang utang, pero ang mahal naman ang bilihin. Or what if we combine presyo and trabaho? Uh, mura ang bilihin, kaya lang wala ka naman trabaho. Or may trabaho ka, kaya lang ang mahal naman ang bilihin. Or what if we combine presyo and kita? May kita ka nga, pero ang mahal-mahal naman ang bilihin. Or... Uh, Mura nga ang bilhin, wala ka namang kita. Or what we look at comparing the utak, utang and trabaho uh, uh, cell, which is uh, may trabaho ka nga, pero ang dami mo namang utang. Or good, wala kang utang, pero wala ka namang trabaho. Or what if we combine kita, trabaho, or trabaho kita, which is the same. Kita, trabaho, trabaho kita. So that's why we have this arrow. So in this thing, we're saying, what if may trabaho ka, wala ka namang sweldo, baba naman ang sweldo mo. Or everyone's making money in the economy, but you, you don't have a job. Wala ka namang trabaho. Or what if we look at this, kita in utang. Uh, malaking nga kita mo, pambayad lang naman ng utang. Or wala kang utang, wala rin kita. So, so that's, that's basically the model that we are going to look at. This pitik sa, sa utak. This is my pitik uh, by utak matrix or pitik sa utak analysis. So a, a deeper analysis of what's going on historically. So the first one is presyo and utang. Uh, presyo at utang or inflation and real debt. 
So the combination of two. Yeah, so you see, indeed, President Marcos had the worst performance in terms of inflation uh, with 3.7 trillion pesos of, of debt uh, somewhere here, 3.7 pesos. And this is 16 points. So this is uh, uh, this is the 16 percent of uh, uh, inflation, but uh, 3.7 tri uh, trillion of, of debt by 1986. So, and then we go to President Aquino years. The inflation went down to 11.9 percent. So the inflation slowed down, uh, but then she also paid debt. We she was able to reduce the debt by 5 trillion uh, or, uh, or 3 trillion or, or, or sorry, 700 um, by 500 billion to 700 billion. So the combination between the two, it shows here that President Corazon Aquino slowed down inflation and at the same time, she paid most many, uh, many of our debt. Uh, President Pinoy, uh, probably has the best position here because he lowered inflation to 2.7% and the debt was down to 3.7 uh, trillion pesos in, in terms of 2018 prices. So, so that what we can see here, and then President Duterte, of course, 3.4% inflation and everyone's complaining, but, but of course uh, we complain, but if we think about what our parents and, and grandparents went through during the part of President Marcos years when they had 16.2% average inflation. Uh, but in President Duterte, that the debt has increased to 4.2 trillion. Uh, keep in mind, this is just uh, external debt. So that in what I would come up here is uh, a general observation. It, it, there had been 16 years of lowering inflation while reducing debt from 2000 to 2016. So what you see here is the debt here has generally declined. And at the same time, all these, the line here, the inflation, the yellow, the green, and the yellow, the inflation has declined steadily in those 16 years. Presyo at trabajo. Uh, we start with President Marcos. So now trabajo, presyo and trabajo. Uh, President Marcos with 16.2% inflation, uh, but then uh, the unemployment was 5.4%, and this 5.4% is the lowest among all these administrations. So like I said, uh, uh, President Marcos performed best in terms of unemployment. But by the way, among economics majors here or those who are into economics, this is referred to as sometimes the, uh, by economists as the Phillips curve. Uh, now, President Aquino, uh, the inflation slowed down by 11.9%, but then uh, unemployment rate also went up. So basically, she paid debt at the expense of higher unemployment. And then you have President Ramos years with 7.8% and 9.5% and, 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 and so on. So this is President Estrada, uh, President Arroyo, and the numbers are here. With, uh, again, lower inflation, but still the unemployment relatively very high at 10%. And then it went down during President Aquino to 6.5% unemployment and inflation of 2.7%. So right there. And then you have 3.4% during the President Duterte and 6.3% uh, uh, unemployment. And, and uh, what I want to highlight here is that uh, if you com if you look at co compare President Marcos and President Duterte and President Aquino, uh, yes, the unemployment rate during President Duterte and President Aquino uh, was higher by one uh, percent. But then again, the, the but then again, you see here, would you have would you rather have would you have rather have a sixteen percent inflation? and 5.4 inflation, or would you rather have 3% inflation and 6.5% inflation? So basically it's a trade of 1%. If you go from here to here, you're giving up 1% higher unemployment to reduce, to slow down the increase of prices by 12%. And I will take this trade off. I would rather be in this position than in that position. 
Uh, then we go to presyo at kita, inflation and GDP growth. Uh, the Marcos years, as indicated here, it started with 16.2% inflation and 3.6% growth. Uh, during President Aquino years, uh, inflation went down, but the expense of slower economic growth. During President Ramos, inflation uh, growth went back to the same as Marcos years, uh, but then he was able to a bit slow down inflation to 7.8%. Uh, and then you have President Estrada, President Arroyo, and President Aquino. And then suddenly right now we have 3.4% under President Duterte, 3.4% inflation under the circumstances that we had shortages in rice. You have the African swine fever, the COVID, and now the Ukraine war. And then of course the 3.1% the uh, growth. And what I want to highlight here is that you see here, we had 30 years of growth and price stability from 1986 to 2016. Starting in this year, you'd see the pattern here. It's all negative slope. And what means is the economy has been growing faster and faster. The growth is accelerating. And at the same time, inflation has been going down all those uh, all those 30 years and reversed during President Duterte. The trabajo at utang, uh, the unemployment and debt. debt. Um, and in the unemployment and debt here, you, you'd see here uh, the, the employment debt trade off uh, from 1986 to 1982. Uh, President Corazon Aquino sacrificed over 4% higher unemployment to pay for 700 billion pesos of debt. And what you see here is President Aquino basically sacrificed unemployment. The unemployment rate increased from 5.4% to 9.7%. And that is at the and that is basically she sacrificed that unemployment to reduce the debt from 3.7 trillion pesos to 3 trillion. So she basically paid 700 billion pesos of debt, but we, she sacrificed 4% higher unemployment. Between Marcos and President Benigno Aquino, uh, Marcos has the better combination with 1% less unemployment. The unemployment rate during President Aquino was 6.5%, although the measurements are a bit different, but still, it highlights the fact that in, in still President Aquino years, uh, the unemployment rate of 6.5% is higher than 5.4%. And still the debt levels are relatively, this. it's at 3.7 trillion pesos. Uh, uh, but there's a caveat here, except the thing here is uh, the 3.7 trillion is something that Marcos actually borrowed and the 3.7 trillion debt, uh, debt in during uh, Marcos uh, during uh, President Aquino years is something that's maintained. Basically, he started with 3.7 tr uh, trillion pesos and ended up roughly at 37 trillion pesos. Where at, so uh, President Marcos actually borrowed, but President Benigno Aquino did not actually borrow. He kept the, uh, the debt where it was. We're going to Trabajo at Kita, that's the these quadrants here, the unemployment and GDP. Uh, again, President Marcos had the uh, lowest uh, unemployment rate. So he, she performed in terms of unemployment rate, uh, but with 5.4% um, um, uh, with the GDP growth of 5.4%. Of, uh, 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 President Aquino, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is unemployment, so unemployment rate of 5.4%. So indeed, President Marcos had the lowest unemployment rate. Uh, so the un unemployment rate went up to 9.7% during President Aquino years. Uh, but then uh, with the growth rate also uh, slowing down. During President Ramos years, uh, 
uh, the economic growth recovered from back to 3.6%, but unemployment rate is still very high at 9.5%. And during Estrada years, again, President Estrada performed worst in terms of unemployment. Uh, but then again, uh, uh, the growth was faster than that of Marcos at 3.9%. Uh, then you have President Arroyo with the uh, growth of 4.8% and uh, unemployment rate of 9%. So, so these are classic things where the uh, economy is growing slowly and at the same time, people don't have jobs. One out of 10 people looking for jobs can find work. Then suddenly the drop of 6.2% uh, the pickup, the highest economic growth, 6.2% uh, among all these presidents, President Benigno Aquino, and then inflation, unemployment rate of 6.5%. And of course, President Duterte, suddenly the reversal in terms of uh, the growth, and that's precisely because of the COVID. And, and what I want to emphasize here is there had been 16 years of growth uh, of and inclusion from 2001 to 2016. So from, from, from that 16 years of pattern right there where unemployment is going down and at the same time, income is growing faster. And finally, we go to the last quadrant, which is uh, kita at, at utang, GDP and, and debt. Uh, Marcos had the highest debt to GDP ratio at 85%. Uh, what that means is for every one peso of income we have, 85 centavos of that, we owe it to outsiders. Aquino borrowed to invest, and President Aquino here in 1986, she borrowed, you'd see the blue line here, that's the debt. The, 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 she kept on borrowing, but you'd see here what started in 1986 is the gray line is the nominal income. Nominal income also started to increase. So she borrowed also, but it resulted to faster economic growth. And because the national GDP increased, the GDP, the debt to GDP ratio went down to 56.6% or 57%. Uh, that is to say now that for every 100, one peso of income, uh, 56, 57 centavos of that is owed to, to, to outsiders. And then, of course, it would pent up during the Asian financial crisis where President Ramos had to borrow uh, uh, in order to, in a sense, ease the pain of the Asian financial crisis. And I'd like to emphasize that before the pandemic, uh, the Philippines had 20 years of more borrowing but faster GDP growth. You see here the pattern. We, we that 16 years of increased borrowing, yes, we were borrowing and borrowing, borrowing, but, but by borrowing, we're actually growing faster. We were investing. And so the result is that the GDP ratio, the debt to GDP ratio had declined now to 23.3% in 2019. Uh, of course, that increased a bit after the pandemic. So that completes the Petik Utak test. And I, I think, I hope you, you have some idea when. So it's not so simple that it's you just think of presyo or, or trabajo only or kita only. These economic variables are interrelated with each other. And in the end, it's clearer where the economy, I think, for me, it's clearer for me when is the worst economic times in our in our in our in the past 50 years. So uh, in in March 26, I was invited by the Philippine Leadership to Society, and the title was Character, Competence, and Purpose para sa Halalan 2022. And and I was asked to present what we can learn from economic data. And basically, I presented you the economic data. But I want to talk to you about the, the, the character, competence, and purpose. Uh, so what are we looking for? We want to have, we have we need someone to have the character, uh, ang katangian, uh, to take the right path. And there is a purpose for the public good. 
uh, there is a there is a pakai there is a mission to do good uh, this is one in the same person this person on the left did not take the right path um, he did not have the character to to be patient to acknowledge that drug users were actually victims in some in that sense but that same person here on the left had the character to write the the right to take the right path uh, he had the purpose to help the poor and for the poor to be to to, to to poor children to go to school and then so he signs and institutionalizes the four Ps. so if i may use the the, the uh, uh, analogy of of the of, of star wars uh, basically this person here this person well this person took the dark path uh whereas this person here took the jedi path the the path of sobriety the path of you know, just, just, just thinking the, the, uh, the, uh, the character to, to the, to, to think what is right for our people and with, with compassion also, and for the purpose for of public good. And then we talk about competence also. This person did not take the, was not competent to, to follow science and this left and he did not have the humility to listen to scientists this person on the right hand side he wasn't that com he was not perfect but he had at least some competence and he actually he's really annoying at times but he in reality he listened to scientists so for the purpose of public good when we listen there's an upcoming debate about the source of our energy the next 20 or so years do we go renewables or do we go nuclear and at least one of the candidate is suggesting that we can start going to nuclear again but what do the scientists say what is the future is the future according to scientists renewables or is the future for nuclear energy so let's 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 think about that and in the end, uh, um, in, let's let's draw as voters. Let's draw a line between neutrality and false equivalency, uh, or objectivity and false equivalency. Let me give you an example. This is not this is neutral and and, and objective. Uh, one might say that because of what's happening, because of the Ukraine war, the prices of oil are going up. There are sectors of society that, seeks, that say that we need to suspend excess tax on, on oil. We need to suspend excess tax on oil. And there are quarters in our society that says that we should not suspend excess tax, but must give voucher to the needy. We must give ayuda para dun sa nangangailangan dahil sa pagtaas ng presyo ng gasolina. And as an analyst, as a voter, we i list with you should listen and and debate within you and each of you and and make some conclusion and decide who do you think you should side on that's being objective and, and neutral and you know just just being analyzing this is false equivalency some say well not some historians established historians say 6 million innocent Jews died in the Holocaust in World War II. Some say the Holocaust did not happen and so very few innocent Jews died. And then as an analyst, you say, I will listen and debate with each other and make my conclusion. That's false equivalency. There is no debate about that. It is given that 6 million Jews died during the Holocaust. And don't make any mistake you go to in between because you go in between that's false equivalency it's like you see a, a white wall in front of you uh, pedro on my left says the wall is white and one on my right says the wall is black and then you say maybe the wall is gray so i will listen to the argument of pedro and one that's false equivalency we know for a fact you see it in front of your face that it is white there is no debate one is a liar, Pedro is telling the truth. 
don't fall into going in between. That's false equivalency. And, and to that, in relation to what's happening these days, what about this? What do you think of this? Is this being educated? Is this being objective? Or this is false equivalence? The National Historical Institute says more than 2,000 people died or disappeared during the martial law. Some say very few, if any, died or disappeared during the martial law. As an analyst, what if I say I will listen and debate with each and make my conclusion? What do you think of that? Is that me being educated or is that me falling into false equivalency? So my final closing statement, so I think, I hope I did not pass that the time, uh, but uh, in my final closing statement, in the end, as voters, it is your decision to vote. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote. Uh, that, 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 that's something that, uh, as the, the Jess would say, something that you should uh, discern about, including uh, Father Saturnino. Uh, but do I objectively balance between fake and real news or do I recognize that objectively balancing fake and real news is false equivalent? So you have to recognize something, issues that should be debated, but you should be able to recognize also that someone is, some people are issuing fake news. And when some people issue fake news, you don't go in the middle. That's a complete lie that's fake. You go to the real news. You don't go in between. There's no in between between real and fake. You just go to the real. And you have to be able to recognize uh, that. Uh, think about this, something to discern about. Do I vote for someone who will follow the dark path or someone who will follow the sober path? The path of anger. Uh, of implementing for the sake of expediency or do we take the path of someone who would take the sober path someone who's thinking the jedi path if you will and then finally do i vote based on someone's omniscience and confidence do we vote for someone who is ever expert and because that person is ever expert in everything uh has all the confidence in the world that that he or she will be able to take care of all of us? Or do we uh, 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 look at someone who has knowledgeable, when I say may kaalaman, of course, we, we don't want someone who has no kaalaman. We don't want someone who has no background of knowing anything. But we want someone who has kaalaman but still has the humility to listen to scientists because no person no human being is omniscient. Only God is omniscient. So someone who has knowledge and humility to listen to scientists. So with that, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So I suppose uh, we are now going to the questions uh, and, and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dumlao, for sharing your expertise on this very uh, interesting topic. And we shall now proceed with the open forum. We shall have a 15-minute uh, open forum. For the Zoom participants, you may write your questions in the chat box. For FB Live participants, you may also write your questions in the comment section. Our technical assistant, Sir Mark Bond, will keep track of your questions and will forward it to us. You may ask one direct question. I want direct and concise questions. And if needed, another follow-up question. So let's check whether there are some questions from our uh, viewers. Okay, we have here, sir, one question. Um, uh, this is actually a comment plus a question. We understand the gravity of the volatile dynamics happening in the world and the domestic economy. Your presence gave us a listener's necessary understanding and probably skills, and thank you for that. Here are my questions. 
A first question, sir, does the confidence or optimism of the people towards the government affects the capability of the government in managing and reinforcing a robust economy? And for his second question, should we be scared of having loans or debts? Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, the first one is, yes, it's important, of course, that we have the confidence uh, we, with uh, our government. Uh, uh, but then again, it's it's not like, uh, I, I'm not sure, but if it's the necessary and uh, it's, 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 uh, it's needed, but it's not necessary. It, well, actually, it's uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient enough. Uh, um, it's necessary if if we have confidence in the economy that in, in our government that's good, okay, that, that helps. But our government still has to deliver. Uh, our government has to follow science still, uh, and. Sometimes we have confidence. Well, people of Germany had confidence in in Germ in Hitler during the war, uh, before they lost, and, and that apparently you can have confidence, and that helped Hitler wage the war. So it it also helped that you know the U.S. had confidence in 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 uh, Theodore Roosevelt then, and Roosevelt had a good mission. So it's necessary. They, it's necessary that we have it, it's we have confidence, but it is not sufficient enough because sometimes we might have confidence in the wrong people. Okay. Uh, um, now that you you asked me about the debt, should we be scared? Uh, again, let, let me share screen. Like I said, I, I had I presented a lower, a longer. This is what's been happening. Uh, a professor Kashon is my is my screen open. My PowerPoint. Oh, yes, it's actually uh, visible. Okay. Uh, to, to answer that, Okay, this is the public public finance. This is the total debt. This is the total debt of, of our government. So it's now uh, this is this is now nominal. It's now 10 trillion, over 10 trillion pesos. Over 10 trillion pesos. And this is the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, you can uh, and what's happening is he's here. Uh, as debt grows to 8.2 trillion in 20. 19 that has been the pattern since this, 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 this last 22 years the debt has been increasing it's now 8.2 uh, in 2019 it's 8.2 trillion pesos but what's happening to the debt to gdp ratio the debt gdp ratio had declined uh, to 42% 42% so what happens is we are borrowing but we are growing faster and that's why the debt to GDP ratio is declining. And so the story goes is you know, you know, you, there's no need to eliminate the debt. You just have to outgrow it. Uh, as Professor Kashan earlier mentioned, I am the dean of John Gokong School of Management, uh, one of my favorite businessmen in our in our modern history is Mr. Gokong Wei. If Mr. Gokong Wei had balanced his budget his entire life, there would not have been the JG Summit group of companies. What he did in his young life is he borrowed money and then he invested and then he his 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 his, uh, his empire grew bigger and bigger. That next thing you know, they have a bigger debt, but they have an even bigger conglomerate. Uh, and then of course that all reversed. Uh, so in that sense, uh, but this is this is another story. This is the foreign debt, the external debt that I've been talking about. So as the external debt grows to 3.6 trillion pesos, the past to 2019, 2021 to 2019, external debt to GDP ratio declines to 18%. So that again, there is no need to eliminate the debt. 
you just have to outgrow it. So there's nothing wrong with borrowing money. Actually, sometimes good as long as you are able to outgrow it. What went wrong during the Marcos years is they borrowed money and they didn't knew it use it wisely to create growth. And that's why the debt to GDP ratio peaked to 85%. This is the debt. Again, this is not the debt to fellow Filipinos. Now, this is a bit of a different story. As domestic debt grows to over 5.4 trillion debt to, to Filipinos, domestic debt to GDP ratio declines to 28%. That is before the pandemic, but suddenly everything. So the story holds you need not pay, the, you just have to outgrow it. And then suddenly it reversed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is something we should look at, but this is in peso, which means uh, if it's in peso, we can always print peso. So, so should we worry about it? Yeah, but we should be wise. We should have to, as long as we outgrow it, we're, we're fine. And we should not be, uh, uh, you know, uh, think as if it is a, a uh, that debt is a taboo. So hopefully that answers, convinces you. Thank you, Prof. Dumlao. We have another question. Um, uh, he, she wanted to be anonymous. Uh, the question goes, was there really a so-called golden years during the Marcos era? How do you explain this as an economist? Um, you see, it's the golden, you think of unemployment, for instance. It, it's, it, it's lowest. There's no, there's no, there is no denying that. The data says, says that it has the lowest unemployment rate among all those presidents that's shown. It has the, it has the decent income, uh, not so bad, but it's average, but definitely has the lowest unemployment rate. So if we think that, that if you think, if you think that way, yeah, you could say that, but what if we complicate our, what if we dip, think, think deeper? Again, the, Pitik sa utak test, not just not just pitik, but use our brains and then we shake our brains a bit, and then you have the lowest unemployment rate. At what cost? There is always a cost to that. You cannot look at it in isolation. It has the lowest unemployment rate, but what happened to the debt? It has the lowest unemployment rate because it has the lowest un unemployment rate. It has the highest employment rate because everyone was. Most people, many people are working, many people are spending, and because many people are spending, what happened to inflation? Inflation was going up by 16%. Again, we are complaining right now with 3.4% inflation. But what if the inflation is 16%, even 50%? Then you imagine how bad that is. But there's no denying the fact that, they, that he had, the Marcos era had the lowest unemployment rate. At a cost, at a cost. Thank you, Prof. Dumlao. Another question from a nursing student. Uh, he is Raul Joshua Limbaga. In your opinion, sir, post Marcos in post Marcos era, who would you consider being the best president? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, but by the way, even if I tell you the best president. I, who I think was the best president in terms of economics, that best is not good enough because we have years of growing and in, in prosperity, but it's not growing enough to the, to the extent that our neighbors are take, still taking us over. So uh, let's put it this way. Uh, we are moving forward, but we are moving forward slowly and not fast enough. During the Marcos years, we are not moving forward. We are we were moving backward. And then post that, we were moving forward, but not moving very slowly. And how I wish we could move forward faster. Thank you, Prof. Um, another question. If we look into the profiles of each president, is it safe to assume that track record, background, or education, educational attainment for that matter, has an impact on their decisions that made an impact on our economy? Uh, 
President Marcos probably was the smartest of them all, right? Uh, but I'm not sure if he listened to... Uh, again, another smart one is President Arroyo. Uh, uh, but then again, uh, uh, like you said, we, we, we need someone who has... Who has kaalaman, who has the, car, who has the competence but has the humility to understand that he or she does not know everything. In the end, I give credit to President Duterte. I don't like him. I, I wouldn't vote him if, I, if, if, if he runs for credit. But we have to give him credit because he listened to the economists. During the start of his administration, many people in Congress are saying, get rid of the, punk, the, peep, the four piece. And what did he do? Eventually, he listened. He listened to the economists around him and said, this is what's good for the poor people. You have to do it. And then he eventually signed it. He's not the smartest of them all, but at least he had the humility to listen and he listened to the experts. So it's also important to think about uh, who the presidential candidates would surround themselves with. Thank you, sir. Um, we also have another question here from a computer science student. We have Renor Benito Jr. He is asking, I would like to ask the current economic situation in regards to how efficiently did our government handle our economy during the COVID-19 pandemic? Was our government prepared for such drastic events? Uh, the government, our government was not prepared that's the first statement. The follow-up statement, no government in the world was prepared for the COVID pandemic. Everyone was not, no government, some did worse than others. No one did well. No one did well. Everyone did bad and some did worse than others. There were also times that we were worse than Hong Kong, but right now we are better off than Hong Kong. Uh, and, and definitely, Australia and 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 and, uh, and New Zealand did better than us all the time. Uh, there was a time that Vietnam did better than us, but right now we are doing better than Vietnam. Uh, what will happen two months down the road, three months down the road? But we, I let's uh, again, let's let's. Uh, uh, we, in a sense, we're, we're locked. The reason why the pandemic here is is uh, is we're doing well right now is it's it's because uh, we had the uh, we have a diversification in in vaccination. Uh, we have we have we have Pfizer, which is Europe, and then we have the American vaccinations, which is uh, what's that uh, Johnson and Johnson and. and and, and then you have the uh, the Sinovac. Uh, the thing about in Europe is they all use Pfizer. That means if uh, a variant that can fight Pfizer comes in, then all of them will be affected. Uh, in the US, they all use the American uh, vaccine. That means if some variant is able to attack that, to, to overcome that, that means everyone will be overcome. Here, what happens here is if someone, if a, a, a variant is able to overcome Pfizer, it will only attack the Pfizer people because many of us have others. Or if a variant is able to attack the Sinovac, only the Sinovac people will be attacked and the others will not have. And, and believe me, it's not by design. It's an accident. We did well because we accidentally have. It's not, it's not like our government intentionally planned that, but... It's an accident, and we're lucky we got into that accident, and and that's why we're doing well right now. But definitely, no government was prepared. We did. We're doing very well right now, not because we 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 we, we plan to diversify. No, it's it's an accident. That's why we're doing well right now. And the U.S. they thought that they're doing doing well. In the end, they were not diversified in their vaccination. So, so they, they're, they could be in danger also. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another question from a faculty member of FSUU uh, from Sir Willie B. Sumampong Jr. 
As an economist, should the next government invest more on agriculture to help revive the economy, given that our country is rich in agricultural resources? Can cause what's happening now is that we keep on importing products. Uh, that's it. Uh, let's let's put it this way. Uh, uh, the mistake of this government is they try to to what is to 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 replace the jeepneys, right? He tries to replace the jeepneys and then replace it with modern, uh, with uh, you know the economic, uh, uh, environmentally friendly, uh, public transportation. Uh, that's that's wrong. You you should not be replacing the jeepneys, but rather you should be outdating them. In other words, you don't kill an industry and then you are. Uh, it's it's a uh, the the purpose here is for the GP drivers. You, uh, let me be. I mean, a, being a GP driver is honest living. Being a farmer is is honest living. That's the truth of the fact. But the truth also is, if you are a responsible parent and as a jeepney driver, would you like your children to be jeepney drivers also? No. You, you'd like to be, you'd like to your children to be not jeepney drivers, but probably drivers of something that's more sophisticated. And the same goes here. Do we want our farmers to be, do, do a responsible parent, farmer want their children to be tilling the same land? And I hope not, because I hope they're ambitious enough that the farmer that we have, the, the, the parent farmer dreams for his or her children to be flying drones and, and taking care of the farmers using technology. That, that's what, what we want. So it's, it's not like we're pouring in money, but it's, 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 we have to be, it's, it, you have to innovate. You have to, you have to outdate the current practice from, from a farmer that, that he or she is to the entrepreneur, high-tech farmer. That's what we want. We, because if you are a farmer, you don't want your children to be doing the same thing, but rather you want your children, if your children is to farm, you want your children to be doing something more high-tech, something more sophisticated to make a profit. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Um, another question, this is from anonymous, uh, this is an anonymous question. How impactful is the Marcos era to the condition of today's economy and today's debt? Uh, it's, uh, we, most of the debt basically is, is uh, from the Marcos years. I think it's, it's already paid up. So what we're doing right now is we're still actually increasing our, our debt, actually. Uh, the, what is important is the debt that we borrow, we outgrow it. What happened so wrong during the Marcus time is the debt that was borrowed was not wisely used. I don't know what happened, but it definitely did not create the right economic growth it did not create the right inflation uh, but right now the debt that we are having we're still borrowing but we are outgrowing so uh, there's nothing wrong with borrowing again uh, um, some of you here have a car and some of you have uh, an annual salary, some teachers. Oh, I'm gonna guess 800,000 pesos per year or 500,000 pesos per year salary, probably like that. But some of you have a car, and you have a mortgage to pay, and that's more than 500 pesos, 500,000 pesos. Because cars, after all, is basic car 700,000 pesos. So that by itself, you already borrowed. But the thing is, you did it because you know that you are taking care of your job. Important thing is you outgrow your debt. What's wrong is you borrow and then you don't work. <laughs> That's, and then you don't use that car to, to go to work. Or that, that's, that's wrong. I mean, 
so yeah, the President Marcos borrowed. Many of that is paid out. I think it's paid out effectively, but we are still borrowing. But we are borrowing right now and we are able to outgrow it, except after the pandemic. That's another story. But after the pandemic, uh, after the pandemic, uh, again, speaking of the debt, after the pandemic, people are saying we have to pay the debt, uh, reduce the debt. That's the wrong thing to do because if you are to reduce the debt, that means you will be taxing people. And people suffering under these circumstances, you tax them when they are suffering, they will suffer even more. What is important is you keep that debt. We pay the interest, we keep that same level of debt, but we outgrow it so that we don't take away tax from the people to pay the debt, but what rather we do something that's more productive. And if we do that, it's the same thing that we have done the past 20 years. We did not reduce our debt. We actually borrowed, but we grow faster. So what we will do the next 12 years is we will, if we don't borrow and we keep on growing, we will be able to go back to pre-pandemic level in 12 years, 10 to 12 years. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question from our FB viewer. We have Patricia in Cabo. She's asking, as an economist, what on what basis do you assess a political candidate? On what basis do I assess a political? Uh, actually, even now when I listen to the to debates, I see it's all populist. No, no offense, they're all pop. They, they're, I, I, they say things that I, makes me makes me scratch my head, but they're do, they're saying things. But uh, I guess that's the politics of it. Uh, uh, but then suddenly they they'll do things differently. It's it's like uh, I, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example. Uh, Pinoy never never gave any. Uh, economic policy during the debates. He never. And it frustrated me some a bit. Uh, it's all uh, kung walang korap, walang mahirap. That, that's all he said. He never talked about the debt. He never talked about raising the tax. He never talked about uh, public-private partnership. Uh, when he won the election, then he talked about policy. Uh, and that's what I'm hearing right now with the candidates. I'm not hearing anything substantial. It's uh, it's all motherhood, motherhood statements. That's why sometimes I don't listen to debates anymore. Uh, but uh, let's just look who they will surround themselves with. And we can only look of their history, uh, their history the past five, six years, what they have actually done. Thank you, uh, Prof. We still have three more questions on the list. So we have another question. Um, how do we convince our student to believe more on data-based information rather than opinions of social, uh, social media influencers? Uh, congratulations. You're doing the right thing right now. It's <laughs> Urian, uh, Urian voters, and I believe you have three sessions, right? I'm not the only one. Uh, four, yes, four, four sessions. Four. Yeah, four sessions. This is the best thing, and you have hope. Oh, I pray that our, that our students uh, hear this and learn the difference between being uh, a judicious versus being a victim of false equivalence. And this is one session that students can hopefully learn. Oh, oh and also, also, uh, uh, the bobo tante does not work. Criticizing people that they're bobo, that doesn't work. It it only backfires, and in, and in a sense, that's 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 the dark path. We have to follow the the lighter path the sober path to say with compassion we say no it's, we just have to do it and it's the hard way but it is the right way thank you prof and we have one last uh second to the last question 
what are the potentials of Mindanao in relation to economic growth? It's, uh, it's it, it, the potential for Mindanao. It's, it's concentrated right now in, in Cagayan de Oro, uh, Sok Sargent, and Davao City, but particularly in Davao and Cagayan de Oro. Uh, but in terms of tourism, it's Caraga. It's in, right down your, it's your neighborhood. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the source. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the source of growth will always agglomerate in the cities. That's, that's the way it works. But it's important that uh, there is also, there's also peace in the rural areas. Uh, and its contribution, it's, uh, it's, let's just say the Philippines will not succeed without Mindanao. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are down to our last two questions. So the, uh, one question from Zoom. There are some who do not believe in data, but believe more on the experiences of some people. For example, regarding the martial law events, their family members did not experience the horrors of it. So they claim that the claims of the others are untrue. How do we, uh, how do we explain this to them using the data available? Uh, uh, for one, let me uh, share with the audience that I, I, I shared with you the, uh, the, the YouTube of uh, a version of, the, of my presentation in, in YouTube. And it's, uh, I tried my best to be, uh, it's my best, probably it's not good enough, but uh, I'll ask, you just watch these videos. You know, it's, uh, people say they didn't feel... Uh, probably, I, but I also understand them because the, the, the truth is, it's been more than thirty years. It's, it's it's more than thirty years, and we've been improving. But all those thirty years, we're not improving fast enough. We're moving forward, but we have been moving forward slowly, and and that's why I, I could see the frustration of other people saying that it's time to replace the the. the the present uh, uh, democratic in, uh, democratic ways of doing things and replace it with something that's faster. Uh, maybe it's time to risk. Maybe it is. You risk for uh, a faster uh, uh, development. But when you vote for that, thinking that you would have a, prop, a faster development, it's a risk because it might backfire. It might actually be reverse. You might go back to what, what, when, what, when it was when we were not moving forward, when we were actually moving backwards. Thank you, sir. For the last question, I have read, and this is from Zoom, I have read that in the online discussion, which says that poverty will never be sold. A politician needs to, say, to stay in power. What is your take about it, Pope? Uh, poverty is uh, is is relevant. Uh, it's it's uh, there will always be poor in relation to the others. Uh, uh, what's poor? But uh, uh, there will always be. We can. It's possible to reduce poverty, but. It is based on certain definition of what is poverty. Uh, the present definition of poverty by World Bank, IMF, and international multilateral institutions is two dollars per day, which is one hundred or one 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 dollar twenty five one dollar fifty cents per day or seventy five pesos per day. So that means uh yung people of, among you na may mga katulong dyan, by definition, hindi na sila mahirap. But the truth is, hindi sila mahirap pa rin sila, as you see. So, uh, so we, first, we, we set, we define what that poverty is. And uh, depending on what the definition of poverty, the, the definition of poverty, the, 
right now is a uh, dollar fifty cents or seventy five pesos per day. Uh, that one is achievable, uh, except the definition of seventy five pesos per day is a pathetic definition. So you, it's it's almost like you're saying that anyone who makes seventy six pesos per day is no longer poor. Uh, but uh, but it is what it is. You have to have a proper definition. But the seventy five pesos per day is something that's we can we can conquer that that's that's doable in in two in uh, there there are things there are things that we don't know that's gonna happen uh there was uh there was for example and i'm gonna give you an example uh inflation right now in the philippines is 3.4 percent inflation in europe is seven percent inflation in the us in, is eight percent uh, if you tell me, if you ask me that 20 years ago, if that's ever going to happen, that our inflation is lower than in America and in Europe, I would not have believed that. But right now, our inflation is lower than theirs. I don't know what's happening. Uh, there was once upon a time that we we borrowed money. We were in debt. But right now, we are a net net lender. Yeah, we borrow also. We still borrow. But believe it or not, we are lending to the IMF. We lend more money than we borrow. If you ask me that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I would not have believed that's ever going to happen. It's happened. Uh, if you ask me if we can conquer poverty, maybe not. But hey, unbelievable things has happened in the past 20 years. Probably not fast enough, but it has ha it happens. It has happened. So there's there's hope. Thank you, sir. May pahabol lang po na question. As an economist, do you think it is possible to lower the rice to 20 pesos a kilo as claimed by a candidate? Uh, there's no free lunch. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can do that, but you're going to take it from somewhere else. Uh, again, para siyang, ano, no? para siyang unemployment. Yes. You have the lowest unemployment. That's true. Baka rin kaya niyang ibaba sa 20 pesos. Kaya niya. Pero at what cost? At what cost? That's why I don't listen to all these debates. All, it's all proud. Sorry. Pero manood pa rin kayo yung debate. But for me, sometimes I don't. Because I get upset. Because they make promises. But uh, I'll do this, I'll do that. But all of this costs money. And they don't tell you where they will get the money. Well... They will lower it to 20 pesos, but at what cost? Where are they going to take it? There, are they going to take it from education, budget of education? Are they going to take it from Department of Defense? Are, are they going to take it from the Department of Health? But certainly they were going to have to get it from some. Or are they going to get it from the people by the taxing us higher? So it, it was, don't, um, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not. Thank you, Dr. Dumlao. That's, uh, that's it for our, op uh, for our open forum. So to wrap up the open forum, may we ask you, sir, uh, for your final words, Pop? Uh, I, I guess the best question that I, I, I got this, this afternoon is what do we do to change the thoughts of, of people who don't listen to or don't listen to facts? And, I, and, and my answer is, what you can do is what you're doing is exactly what you can do. And, and I'm, I'm thankful that I'm part of what you are doing and I'm thank you for the invitation. Uh, I see 367 participants. I, I pray that these 367 participants in the, in the Zoom are, are actual voters. And I, I pray that these 365 are at least affect, uh, they start thinking between the difference between false equivalency and false equivalency and in, in, in being objective. At, that you recognize the difference between someone who takes the dark path or someone who takes the right path. Uh, and I hope you recognize the, someone who has the humility to listen to scientists and accept the fact that no one is ever perfect versus knowing, recognizing that some people say that they are omniscient, almost godly in their knowledge. And when they say that, it probably uh, most likely they are the ones that are, that are not 
good enough to you know, put up. But, uh, nonetheless, 365 here. All of you have two parents. Well, most of you have two parents, so hopefully, and you have siblings, so hopefully this this multiplies and we have 20 days to go. Uh, if this is multiplied squared uh, 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 up to the, to, to, to the 20th power, then, then, then we can probably make, make a difference. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for also accepting our invitation. That is quite a learning experience from our speaker, Dr. Dumlao. It always helps uh, to have a more information so that we can make an informed and responsible decision come May 9. We also thank our participants for being engaged in the second session of the Orion Voters Education Series. Please allow me to read the certificate of, our, of appreciation to our speaker. Father Saturnino Urius University presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Luis F. Dumlao for his invaluable service and contribution as resource speaker in the session, The Current State of the Philippine Economy and the Leader We Need during the Orient Voters Education Webinar Series held online on April 22, 2022. Given this 22nd day of April at Father Saturnino Urius University, Butuan City, Philippines. Signed by Reverend Father James Michael Abellanosa, Director of Students and Alumni Affairs, Dean Donna F. Espuerta, Dean of Arts and Sciences Program, Engineer Zinaida de Azura, the Vice President for Administrative and Students Affairs, and Reverend Father Randy Jasper C. Ochige, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Research. To be critical in choosing the next leader should, uh, should consider the present condition and also to be keen on historical perspective. As Professor Dumlao had highlighted on Pitik Utak test, factoring in inflation, employment, income, and external real debt is its interrelation and the indicators are conditioned to delve into. In order to be more critical and discerning in choosing the next leader, that will define a desirable condition of the economy. We would like to remind our participants that there are two more sessions in the Orion Voters Education Series. This is just the second one. The third session will be on April 28th, Thursday at 2 p.m., the speaker is Prof. John Ray Ramos of Ateneo de Manila University and the author of Bayani Biographies. He will talk about historical revisionism and its implication to voters' decision. To get your certificate of appreciation, you are requested to answer the evaluation. The link is provided in the comment section or in the chat box. For our games, the post, -test, the post test will be uploaded or will be given in your FSU you Learn by 5 p.m. The top five winners will be announced in the next session. Next session. For the GE students, take a screenshot of your score in the game and upload it in your respective assessment in your GE classes. You will earn points for each upload. We would like to thank the faculty members of the Social Sciences Division our speaker, Dr. Luis F. Dumlao, Ms. Donna F. Esperta, Father James Michael Abellanosa, Dr. Sherlyn Alegre, Mr. Lyndon Buque, Political Science and Economic Society, Serve and Psychology Society, Communicators Guild, Urian Publication, FSU Supreme Student Government, and the Strategics and Communication Office. That's the second session of the Urian Voters Education Series. This has been your facilitator, Elroy, and together with Sir Mark Bonbasadre, our technical assistant. See you in the next session. And again, let your light shine brighter this election.